Hello. So welcome to this lecture on evaluating alternatives. So you have gone through the whole analysis process. You have gathered your requirements. You have analyzed your requirements using context level diagrams, using data flow diagrams, and using the various diagrams like activity diagrams, state diagrams, etc. And you are now sure of what the system should be like. Now, before you go into the design stage, you need to first look at the way that you want to either d develop or deploy the system. So before you come up with your final solution, you need to look at the various alternatives that you have in terms of implementing the system. And that's what we are going to look at in this lecture. So when it comes to evaluating software uh, uh, um, alternatives, after you've analyzed the requirements and <coughs> you are now designing that solution, you need to, sh to pick the actual software or the actual technologies that you need to implement. And you need to identify the software and the hardware requirements that are required for this new system. So you need to start by evaluating the software because the software components are the most important part of your system. And after that, then you can look at the hardware components. So evaluating software alternatives is part of systems analysis, which you do before you even move to the system's design stage. Because when you're now designing, you should at least know the direction that you, you would rather take when it comes to the implementation and development of your system. Now, when you're evaluating your software, you need to decide whether you want to develop it in-house or you want to buy a commercial off-the-shelf system. So as part of that evaluation, you need to look at what kind of application are you actually developing or which application do you need? Do you need a vertical or a horizontal application? Basically, a vertical application is an application that is created for a specific skill set in a business. Okay, so this one is just focusing on one thing. For example, it could be a system just focusing on accounting. It could be a system just focusing on IT management. And the testing of these systems can be long and these systems can also be large. But you can also have horizontal systems. So horizontal applications, these are applications that are used across industries. They come uh, with minimal customization. They, are, they already have some modules developed, but you just have to do some uh, customizations to suit your needs. And these applications can be used for a variety of uh, purposes. And you don't really need... Um, any one set of skills to be able to, to use these systems. These include your word processors, your spreadsheets, your financial software, web browsers, etc. So as you come up with your solution, you need to think whether you are actually coming up with a vertical application or a horizontal application, because that will then affect your decision on whether you develop it in-house or you buy a commercial off-the-shelf system. So why would a company decide to develop a software in-house? Some of the reasons include satisfying unique requirements. So some commercial off-the-shelf systems will not have the requirements that you require. And then it also means it minimizes changes in business procedures and policies. So you have got your unique way of doing business that is giving you a competitive advantage in the market. And you do not want to disrupt that. So for you to maintain that way of working, you may have to develop your own system. Then you may also need to develop an in-house system to meet constraints of existing systems. So maybe you have some legacy systems um, or some legacy technologies as well that you have in your environment which are no longer or which are not compatible with uh, systems on the market. So you need to develop your own to be able to create that compatibility between systems. Then you may also need to develop in our so that you can develop your own internal resources and capabilities so that you have a team that can manage your systems as well as you want and which understand them fully also the issue of interoperability of legacy systems which we have mentioned as well as to meet regulatory and security requirements at the same time why would a company decide to buy a software package instead of developing itself so in most instances it's actually cheaper to just buy a software than to develop it yourself and it requires less time to implement because most of the building blocks have already been uh, put in place for you then there's also the issue of reliability so you find that most of the software packages that you buy would have been proven to be reliable and you'd have been measured against performance benchmarks to prove that they are, it can actually deliver as uh, advertised then also those softwares that you're going to buy may have been implemented by other companies already so it makes it easy for you to adopt them 
and put them in your company because a proof of concept has already been done in other companies. It also requires less technical development of staff. So you will find that most of your staff will not require a lot of skills to be able to manage these softwares, softwares. as well as um, future upgrades will be provided by the vendor. So that takes the load off you in terms of um, upgrading the system and you are guaranteed or you are assured that for some time the vendor might or will be giving you some updates to that system. So those are the reasons what that you would weigh between buying a commercial off the shelf system or building your own in-house system. Then another way that you could just go is to customize software packages which would allow you to purchase a, a basic package then you just customize it. So some systems just come with the packages that aren't customized and then you customize them to suit your own needs. And then you can also negotiate with the vendor to make enhancements and then you pay or you purchase and modify yourself. So you can do an in-house development, you can buy a commercial off the shelf system, you can customize the software on your own or you can actually outsource the whole system. So you may not even have to develop the system or buy it but you might actually outsource both the development as well as the hosting of the system and you may actually end up having ERP. So ERPs also come with some modules that you need. These ones can also be under commercial off the shelf systems. Or you can actually have your system hosted on the cloud as you use application service providers or software as a service uh, on the cloud computing front. So these are the various alternatives that you consider as you decide which way to go in terms of developing the solution for the problem that you have gathered and analyzed requirements for. So what is the role of the analyst in all this? So the, there are eight um, ways of implementing a system or developing a system that have been listed on this slide. And starting from the top one, that's where you need the most involvement of a systems analyst, right to the bottom one at number eight, where you need the least involvement of, um, of an analyst. So you find that within our systems, you definitely need to have the analyst involved so that we develop exactly what we need. Then when it comes to um, end user applications or outsourced customized package, the analyst's involvement there is very is quite minimal because now they're just focusing on the customization side and not in the overall development of the system. Then on the last one where it's install plug and play um, software package, generally the analyst there is not involved because everything is already in the system. They're just installing it and start using it. So the analyst may not be required for that role. So how do you evaluate um, a software package with the intention of purchasing it. So the first one is to evaluate the system's requirements that you have for your system, okay? So you compare your, your requirements that you gathered during your analysis stage against the features of the system and then you see if those features can match your requirements. Then you also estimate the volume of data that is going to be processed by the system as well as the future growth of the system as well as the company and see if the two are in tandem so that you can actually have a system that you can use for a long time and which, which is compatible with your needs. You also need to look at the hardware constraints that the information system at hand have. So some systems may require a lot of hardware or they may require specialized hardware and that can either add costs or an advantage to you. So you need to weigh whether it's advantageous, the hardware constraints available are advantageous or not. Then after you've done that, you prepare a request for proposal. So a request for proposal or quotation is basically going to people who develop these systems and asking them to come up with an, an RFP that details what the system is like, how much it would cost, what kind of support they will give you and how long it will take you to pay or to recoup your, um, your expenditure and the like. So that will be some of the steps that we have to take initially. Then after you have done that, you then identify also the potential software vendors who is more like most likely to give you this kind of um, system then you evaluate your software package alternatives the various vendors will present stuff various packages to you and then you evaluate them then you buy the software and install it so firstly you do an internal um, analysis of your own needs that is the re the requirements analysis stage then you re you flight a request for proposal and then after while, after which you pick a software that you want and then you install it. 
So how about hardware um, alternatives? So we've been talking of software um, alternatives or software options that we have. What about the hardware alternatives? How do we look at which hardware is, is the best? So as you think of your software, you should also always be thinking of the hardware that you're going to run the software on. So you may think of say, having a 10 key purchase where the vendor will come with everything and they will install your software or your system on the hardware and they will leave everything running for you. Or you may also look at people who may or option of integrating systems from various vendors and this you may need to hire separate system integrators or use your own internal stuff <clears throat> then there's also the issue of site preparation so your solution should also consider whether it's going to use an already existing um, site or you're going to use a or build a whole new site for this system or buy new um, infrastructure for the system that includes things like aircon fire protection security both physical and logical you know, uh, UPS is that's the power systems and then your cabling as well as your backups <clears throat> and also you need to consider the total cost of ownership of your hardware is it better for you to buy the hardware yourself or to rent it is it better for you to build a private cloud which you own which you buy everything for yourself or to just go to a public cloud where you use you pay for only what you've used so those are the kind of options you need to be considering now as you move towards um designing your solution so once you have looked at your hardware and software alternatives you have looked at the various options that you have what you now need to do is to come up with a system requirements document which is basically the systems requirements specification which is the product of the um, analysis stage okay so in this document you have the requirements of the new system you will look at the various alternatives that were considered then you make a recommendation of which alternative or which solution or which option you prefer and then you do you also identify what the various developers must deliver in a new system based on what the users is have um, told you and this may include ad any other information that you require so this document will be what is the combination of all the stuff that you've done in the analysis stage so armed with this document you then go to present to management your findings and your recommendations and as you present to them you're actually seeking approval for the development of the system because now we have reached the stage where more money needs to be forked out for them to actually buy for the to buy the software and the hardware as well as hire the skills required for the deployment and maintenance of this system so if you want more information you can read um, you can follow those links on the slide they can actually give you more information on evaluating alternatives so that's basically what we have on evaluating alternatives let's brief, briefly go into case tools so case tools are computer aided software engineering tools basically these are tools that automate a number of your processes as you go through the analysis development and deployment of your solution so case tools are computerized software development tools that support the developer when performing one or more phases of the software life cycle and or when it comes to support supporting software maintenance so this software is used to support various process activities as you develop your software so this provides software process support by automating some processes. So case tools, these computer aided software engineering tools, they automate certain processes. For example, things like documentation, code generation, and the like. We'll see some of them uh, when you look at the features of a case tool. Then this tool can be used at any stage of the software development life cycle, from planning to analysis, to design, as well as implementation. So the benefits of using a CAS tool include improved software quality because there is enforced di discipline by the standardization of notation since the system is the one that's doing it for you you will find that the quality of your software becomes better because less shortcuts are taken and people are forced to follow a certain convention as they develop their systems these CAS tools also help in the communication between development team members and hence the the various developers we have a common understanding and a common common goal leading to an improved software system information is also illustrated through diagrams that are typically easier to understand so case tools as part of their uh, automation requirement they document and the documents that they come up with 
can also be easy to read based on the diagrams that they produce. Therefore, and also the development information is centralized. So the information for the system that is being developed is found in one place. So anyone who wants that information can get it from one place and therefore there's less distortion of information or a less leaking of information coming from places that are not authorized. Case tools also re reduce the time and effort required to develop a system because a lot of tasks are automated, hence it makes it much faster and uh, easier to complete them. They also enhance reuse of various uh, tools or various outputs of the project that include code, documents, etc. And this can also reduce case. This can also reduce maintenance costs that are associated with maintaining the system because we have managed to come up with uh, reusable models of the system that we can easily replace whenever necessary. Then there's also substantial service savings in resources required for software development because this system automates a lot of tasks. You may not need a huge team. Also, it makes it faster, so you may use less costs to accommodate the team or the consultants that you hire. Then it also promotes a shorter time to market because of the speed of development. There are substantial savings in resources for maintenance because your information for maintenance is centralized. You have come up with a reusable model that can be used for maintaining the system and case tools have automated a lot of the processes hence making it easy for uh, maintenance then there's also greater reuse so you can actually use reuse some of the modules or some of the information that you have generated from your project in other projects which makes it easy for you to actually develop other projects even faster then there's also the reduced generation of defects coupled with increased interactive identification so because of standardization and higher quality of information there are less errors made when developing the system. However, case tools also have some limitations that they come with. Firstly, they are not as flexible when it comes to documentation. So the documentation they produce may come in a format that we are not really happy with, or they may come um, as a huge document. So it may produce a lot of unnecessary documentation, which will just cause a lot of problems for us as we drown in reading unnecessary information. Then also, case tools can help you to have complete and syntactically correct solutions, but that does not mean that you are actually complying with the requirements. So you may have a system that, that works well, that runs well, but is it actually solving the problem? So at times the standardization and uh, automation that case tools provide can actually be a problem it, in itself because it does not give us the flexibility to actually customize some of these things to be able to uh, meet the requirements that were stated for us. Then there are also cost, cost, uh, costs associated with the use of the tool. You need to buy the tool, so it could be very expensive to buy as well as train the people that are going to be using the tool. So those are some of the challenges that you may have with case tools. So we have generally three generic types of uh, case tools. The first one are uppercase tools, which are basically our front-end tools, which are used for requirements gathering, requirements analysis, and coming up with design workflows and activities. This is what, these are the tools that are used during the analysis and design phases, and they support the business and analysis modeling of the system. So this one, the uppercase tools basically help us to understand our requirements and come up with a conceptual solution and then help us as we design the system. Then we have lowercase tools. Lowercase tools are basically backend tools that we use for the development of the actual solution. So our development kits, our development runtimes, Yop are the ones that we find under lower case tools. Then we have integrated case tools. Integrated case tools provide for the entire life cycle. So it's basically a combination of the upper case tools and the lower case tools combined into one solution. So what are the some of the tasks that are done by a case tool, a computer aided software engineering tool? So this case too can help us come up with a design generator. It can help us generate a design using the de design generator. There will be analysis tools helping us do a requirements analysis faster. There's a code generation generator helping us to produce a system code faster. Database generator which helps us to quickly 
come up with the tables which are uh, integral and congruent. Then we also have a prototype ping two that can help us to come up with various prototypes. We can also have a screen and reports generator. Security and version control can also be pro provided for error checking tool, document generator, and drain tool. So you can see that by just doing one piece of work, the case tool can now produce all these other things for you quite easily. And therefore, it makes your work easier and it makes you easier to it makes it easier for you to quickly produce uh, the solutions to the problem. So basically this lecture was on evaluating alternatives trying to find the options that are best for your solution as you now come to the end of your requirements analysis stage then you also we also looked at our case tools our computer aided software engineering tools and seeing how they benefit us as well as their limitations and some of the features that they have which can help us so thank you very much for listening to this lecture